Thank you very much, Veronica. And thank you for having me again. We've been traveling around the Jewish world probably since 2014, 2013 together. And thank you, thank you everybody to come and spending your evening with us. Alex and I spent over six weeks in Portugal this year from March and April doing extensive research about little known or almost unknown story, the saga of Sephardim, the history of the Sephardic Jews. The result of this research will be in the upcoming book, Shellen's Jewish Travel Guide and Portugal, uh, and my current series of lectures on the Sephardim story. The first part was dedicated to the general history of Sephardic Jews from biblical times through the law of nationality and return in 2015. And tonight we will be talking about We'll be talking about uh, two archipelagos, two autonomous regions in Portugal, Madeira and Azores. You see stories of islands in the Atlantic Ocean. You can see the map on the screen. These stories have been reported since classical antiquity. Tales of fortunate isles or isles of the blessed were sung by poets like Homer and Horatio. The Middle Ages saw the emergence of new set of legends, sinister legends about the islands in the middle of the sea of darkness, where giant waves of boiling water can swallow ships of the coal and everybody on board. However, the recorded history states that Madeira was discovered by the Portuguese in 1419 and Azores in 1427. But, and there is always but in every story, and his story is no exception. Recent discovery of the mouse bone and its DNA and lake sediment suggests that the Mid-Atlantic archipelagos we're about to go to were actually discovered much, much earlier than the Portuguese, maybe 600 or 1500 years earlier by the Vikings. But we will start uh, with Portuguese. We will focus together on the Portuguese history. So what's the relationship of this archipelagos to the mainland? You can see on uh, the top on this slide on the top, the map, you see the Iberian Peninsula, you see uh, Morocco and Western Sahara. Uh, both of these archipelagos have been enjoying significant degree of autonomy until 1976, when new constitution in Portugal proclaimed them political, uh, autonomous political regions. The history of the Jews on this archipelagos is not well known. It's between nothing and a little bit, and it's still under the radar for most historians. However, the Jewish narrative on both of these archipelagos spans entire recorded history of these islands. What I want us to remember now, and we will take it throughout our presentation this evening, that there were five historic and geopolitical factors that influence underlined, determined, shaped Jewish presence and Jewish experience on these islands. And the first one being the age of discovery and the Jew role of Jewish scientists in it. The second one, uh, edicts of expulsion from Spain in 1492, from Portugal in December of 1496, there was no real expulsion from Spain, uh, from Portugal. It's almost immediately turned into the edict of forced conversion. So the third uh, factor was uh, inquisition, persecution, 
massacres. The fourth factor, legislative changes that legislate other religions other than just Catholicism and proclaim a separation of church and state. And the fifth one being World War II. So we will approach Jewish history in archipelagos uh, within the world history and history of the global Jewish diaspora. So let's talk about the age of discovery. Historians suggest that this is a time period from 1400 through 1600. However, some dated earlier to the year of 1341, when a fleet of three vessels sails from Lisbon, or rather west of Lisbon from Belem, and discovered and explored the Canary Islands of the northwestern coast of Africa. This expedition showed no profit, and Castile, Spain, later gained control of the islands. But this voyage was the first official exploring maritime expedition by a European state. So I would rather start age of discovery Portuguese age of discovery, global age of discovery from the 1341. You see, before the Portuguese, all maritime explorations were centered in Mediterranean, not in the Sea of Darkness with boiling water, not in the Atlantic. And they were done not by the state, not by the country, but by small private companies or individual captains, adventurous captains, very few of them bothered to take their notes or draw a chart. So the, whatever they discovered, cumulative value of their discoveries was very uh, negligible. And every new generation was almost as ignorant as the previous ones. And navigation was by God and by guess. It were the Portuguese, they brought it on an entirely different level. So what was the Jewish role there? First, let us go through key discoveries that made by Portuguese that changed the world map. 1488, Bartolomeo Diaz sailed around the Cape of Good Hope. So he proved uh, that he Atlantic and Indian Ocean flowed into each other. Indian Ocean was not landlocked as was thought previously. And his discovery paved the way for Vasco da Gama's voyage to India. And it happened in 1498. In 1500, Pedro Cabral discovers Brazil. 1522, Ferdinand Magellan circumnavigates the globe. To understand age of discovery and the brilliant brains behind it, we have to revisit, if you already visited Porto or visit mainland Portugal and in the north, the city of Porto. And you can see map on the left and on the right in the center of the city and its central square, you see the monument to the man named Henry, the navigator or Portuguese called him Infante Dom, Henrique. And he was born in 1394 in Porto. You can see this gray mansion that still exists. He was arguably the most important Portuguese person of all time. He put his country on the figurative, figuratively speaking, on the map by putting many previously unknown mysterious faraway lands on the literal map of the world. And he, that's where he was born. He was the middle child of the King Zhao, and I can't say Zhao properly, I will call him by his English name, John the First in English translation, and his uh, English queen, his English wife, Queen Philippa of Lancaster. She was, by the way, sister of Henry IV of England. Uh, Henry was a brilliant scholar and most talented organizer. We would now would call him brilliant program and project manager. He was a man of vision. 
and the brains behind Portugal Dare and Sea Voyages. He was one of what was called marvelous generation that created and drove age of discovery. While his many brothers and nephews became kings, he didn't care. He worked behind the scenes in making his country the greatest country in the world. He was a religious man, the head of Order of Christ, which was a powerful and very rich brotherhood of soldier monks located in Tamar. And he used the money, the money of this order, to found uh, and finance maritime to find his found his find his academy and finance maritime exploration. His academy was academy of navigational science and of any the other sciences like cartography, astronomy, and so on. And it was at the end of the world. Look at the map. It's in Sagres. So it's Greggy, Vinswap, Wedge Shape Point that judged uh, Judson to Atlantic. And he recruited most brilliant minds from the known world. He was the first internationalist. I would call him pioneer of inclusivity. He did not care if the person he recruited, the scientist, was a Christian, Muslim, or Jew. It didn't matter what mattered, what this person did in the past, and what he can do for Henry and Portugal. Uh, Ian Madeira and Azores, you know, they were discovered from Sagres, from here. So now I want us to stop brief briefly in Belém. It's to the west of Lisbon. See, if you ever visited Belém, and if you did not, when you in uh, Lisbon, you absolutely have to, because there you would see how Portugal celebrate the voyages that made this country the Europe most uh, the bear of Europe uh, wealthiest country, the, uh, probably wealthiest country in the world. You see the Tower of Belem, the it was a departure point for voyages at the age of discovery. When sailors returned, the tower welcomed them back. And there last night, before going into the sea of darkness, they would spend in the monastery of Geronimus. And it's, it's a beautiful limestone church and monastery stretches 900 feet along the Balham waterfront. Very beautiful. It's late Gothic with Melurian style, named after King Manuel who ruled from 1495. And this is a style that celebrates, celebrates Portuguese success in age of discovery. It contains elements from uh, sheep anchors or sheep robes, so exotic fruits and vegetables. So to remind everyone forever and ever, made in stone, what Portugal did for itself and for the world. And yes, in this monastery, uh, the great Vasco da Gama is buried, first explorer who connected Europe and Asia. Uh, everybody stops by the Monument of Discoveries, where all main players of this great age uh, um, uh, uh, are represented, starting with Henry the Navigator in front, holding the model of the caravel and the map. You see the... Portuguese success was based on few pillars, and of course, first being Henry the Navigator and the caravel. It was small, easily navigatable ship that allowed the Portuguese to explore the Atlantic and made his make all their discoveries. And they also had great scientists. The, some of them, you will. Uh, if you know where to look, you will see that there are few of them who are Jewish or of Jewish descent. It's Pedro uh, de Cavilla, Jacob of Mallorca, Pedro Nunes, and they're all, uh, it's in the west side. See the, this great mind of Sephardic Jews, they made possible continuous application of scientific discoveries that they made to the navigational problem and uh, problems. And that's why 
the age of discoveries was so successful for the Portuguese. They, it depended upon the, this continuous application of scientific theory and technology to navigational challenges. Like Jacob de Mallorca that on the west side of this uh, monument of discovery, he was leading cartographer in the employ of Henry the Navigator. He was skillfully adding newly uh, found territories and to ever changing and growing global map. And that's his techniques that was taught in Segres Academy. Uh, Abraham Zakuta, who is not on this monument, he was the greatest astronomer, astrologer, mathematician, rabbi, philosopher, historian, and instrument maker. His instruments made the age of discovery what it became in history. His charts, his nautical charts, his instrument were used by the person we know as Christopher Columbus, by Vasco da Gama. And by the way, the crater on the moon is named after him. Pedro Nunes was one of the greatest mathematicians of all ages, and he renowned for his fundamental contributions to nautical science. He was the first ever to apply mathematics to navigation and to cartography. You can connect with the scientists, even though you might not read their names, but you will see the models, copies of the of their instruments that made the, the discoveries possible. We even went to Evora, the main city of Alentejo region of Portugal, to see these two books that became the pillars or the foundation the reason for successful age of discovery. One is Abraham Zacuta's Almanac Perpetuum, and another by Francisco Ferreira, treatise on this era and on the art of navigation. So what I wanted you to remember, the incredible uh, contributions, the brilliant Sephardic scientists made to these discoveries. First, they made the their contributions were to mathematics, astronomy, cartography, medicine, philosophy, economics, multiple scientific areas, continuous contribution uh, of discoveries in these sciences that were uh, applied to navigational issues. They warranted continuous application of them to navigational program, uh, problem. They also ensured Portuguese naval supremacy, and they did nothing less than establish a foundation for modern science in general, and nautical science in particular. So now uh, we will go into the second factor that explained why, why the Jews of Portugal, why Iberian Jews would seek other lands. Why would they go to, uh, say, Azores and Madeira, among other places? So we'll talk now about persecution and massacres, the expulsions of the Jews from Spain and Portugal, and Inquisition in this country. Anita Navinsky, a historian whom I revere and highly respect, she passed away recently. She was a renowned scientist in historical department and believe in Sao Paulo. And she was Brazilian Jew of Polish descent. She dedicated most of her career researching the connection between massacres, persecution, inquisitions, and between the islands in the Atlantic, like Brazil. It's her who wrote Jews Build Brazil. In our case, it's between Inquisition and Madeira and Azores. She wrote Madeira, Azores, other islands in the Atlantic were in great part settled and developed by converted Jews. 1300s. Something happens in Europe. Black Death, it was called. Uh, a plague that killed most of European populations. And of course, who was to blame? The Jews, because they poisoned the wells. So one would be called pogroms, which would be achronistic if we apply it to the 14th century. One pogrom after another, one uh, massacre after another. And the worst, 
pogrom was in CV in 1391, probably the worst anti-Jewish outbreak. Uh, over 4,000 Jew Jews were killed within a couple of days, and then it spilled over all over Spain. The uh, accounts vary, but it's between 50,000 to 100,000 Jews that were killed in 70 towns in Spain during three months. At that time, blood, blood libel is born. Holy Child of La Guarda in Spain was killed by who? Of course, by Jews who needed his blood to make their Passover uh, matzah. So, and surprisingly, when we were visiting Madrid in 2016 or 2018, I looked at the website for Archdiocese of Madrid, official website that still maintained that alleged events uh, that actually took place, which is interesting. It goes through the 21st century. In Portugal, the worst massacre ever was in 1506, Lisbon massacre. It happened during Passover that coincided with Easter. And it, this, until the late 1990s, when the book by Richard Zibler appeared, the last Kabbalist of Lisbon. This event was not even mentioned. The Jews of Lisbon did not know about it when thousands and thousands of people were killed and tortured and burned on Rossi Square. And only after this book, it changed how history was presented in Portugal. And if you in Lisbon and you come to the center in this San Dominican Square, you will see the small monument where in the Jewish star it says, in memory of the thousands of Jews who were victimized by intolerance and religious fanatism, killed in the massacre that started April 1506 on this square. People were happy to have to have a ball. It was entertainment. Uh, the sailors from different countries, they rushed into Lisbon to take part in the fun. They even paid money to buy wood to burn people, kill the Jews. It was all over town. So events like that certainly made people wanted to escape. Now we're talking about the Inquisition that was established in Spain in 1478 and the Edict of Expulsion of 1492. The most Catholic monarchs, King Ferdinand, Queen Isabel of Spain, they completed Reconquista, reconquering the country that were under the Moorish domination since 700 years, 711. After they got the final stronghold of the Moors, Granada, what was the first matter of business? Not to finance Columbus to go and discover America for us. No, they wanted to get rid of the Jews. So they wrote the edict in which it said, we with the counsel advice of great noblemen of our kingdoms resolved to order the Jews and Jews of our kingdoms to depart and never to return. About 120,000 of Jews went to Portugal that was still open and was good for the Jews. Uh, the rest converted, became Anusim, the children of the first one. And as they say, about one third of the huge Jewish communities of Spain went to Ottoman uh, Empire. They went to what we would call now Greece and Turkey, and to places, to countries in North Africa. They went all everywhere. And many of them that came to Portugal had to leave through the edict of expulsion of the Jews from Portugal. King Manuel the First, first was a good guy for the Jews, but then um, because of his ambition to become the king of all Iberia, he wanted to marry 
in Infant Isabella, daughter of most Catholic monarchs. But this first point of his marriage contract was that he has to get rid of his Jews. But he did not want to make the same mistake as Ferdinand did. You know, after the edict of expulsion from Spain, the great Sultan of Ottoman Empire exclaimed, and they called Ferdinand the wise man, he expels the Jews, impoverishes his country by enriching mine. Spain went through economic collapse, and Manuel didn't want to do that. Not that he will love the Jews, but he loved their brain, he loved their money. And uh, do you know what was the most common profession in Portugal among the Jews? Shoemakers and donkey cart makers. You know, what if all shoemakers would run away and there will be no donkey carts? So he allowed the Jews to go to other countries, but only if they do it from three ports, Lisbon, Faro on the south, uh, and Porta. And then, no, it's not three ports, it's just Lisbon. You have to come at certain times. It was March 1497. Bring all your money. If you don't want to become Christians, there would be ships waiting for you. Over 20,000 Jews came to Lisbon with all their money, and they had to surrender all their Jewish books. Uh, nothing was allowed, and you can take Jewish books. Uh, but there were no ships. The Jews were ambushed by clergy, by population so happy to have another uh, fun hunt of the Jews. And this holy water was sprinkled of them. So in, in a matter of few days, there were no Jews in the kingdom. The edict of expulsion of the Jews in Portugal quickly became the edict of forced conversion. So Manuel could to tell his future in-laws there are no Jews in the country anymore. The Inquisition happened much later in 1536. I was often asked why. Why if Spain it was before even the Edict of Expulsion? Why it's almost 30 years later than uh, the Edict of Expulsion in Portugal? And historians have no answer. Maybe because Manuel first promised the Jews that he understands it takes time to get rid of all traditions. He gave them 20 years. 20 years never happened. But Inquisition in Portugal, it's 15 See, 36. Who were their favorite victims? Not the Jews. There were no Jews, and Inquisition had no jurisdiction for other people with other religion than Catholics. It were new Christians, or Maranas, which means swine. King John III, who established the Inquisition in Portugal, was passionate about persecuting the converses. And this famous painting, Expulsion of the Jews, that actually was forced conversion. Now we're coming to very important moment in history, to legislations that led to the re-emergence of Jewish communities in mainland Portugal and the islands of Madeira and Azores. The first ones in 1773, Pombalin legislation, and if you read about Jewish history in Portugal, that's how it's called, Pombalin legislation. Marquis de Pombal had a position similar to the prime minister of today, secretary of the state of internal affairs during the government of King Jose V. And he was the man who rebuilt Lisbon after devastating earthquake of 1755. In Jewish history, he is the person who eliminated discrimination against the Jews. He did not destroy the Inquisition completely, but he they would not allow the Inquisition to persecute new Christians. There were officially no Jews. And by that time, it was already third generation people living in Catholic religion. The next moment, it's 
legislation of 1821, the end of Portuguese Inquisition, and the third legislation, 1910, protection of religious freedoms of foreigners, because any real Jew coming to the country would be a foreigner, as long as worship would remain domestic and private, not in synagogues. And the revolution of 1910 overthrew the monarchy and replaced it with the first uh, Portuguese Republic. So you see this legislative changes created conditions for new Atlantic Jewish diaspora, arriving mainly in North Africa and Gibraltar, and there were Sephardic Jews whose uh, ancestors came from Iberia after expulsion, running away from Inquisition. And they came to mainland Portugal and to the archipelagos of Madeira and Azores and well. And the main attraction was commercial and business opportunities, plus these archipelagos were uh, duty-free, which is good for business. I think that uh, the um, notion of diaspora goes much beyond removing one from the homeland or much beyond uh, travel or expatriation of immigration. And when diaspora is applied to Jewish experience, it takes very interesting, very its specific contours, contours and dimensions. Now we're ready to come to the islands of Green Gardens as Madeira was caused by, called by first explorer. It's an archipelago that includes eight volcanic islands. You can see where are the eight. You can see one a big one and one smaller on the right upper corner, Porto Santo. Uh, and not only these two, Madeira and Porto Santo that inhabited. And they are located in Atlantic Ocean of, of the northwest coast of Africa and uh, Madeira is about 600 miles from the mainland Portugal. The population of entire Madeira archipelago, which would include just two islands, BC before COVID was 255,000. Over 50% of these people uh, of the population lives in uh, Pancho, the capital of Madeira. And when you explore this island, it's uh, you encounter incredible natural beauty. Madeira actually means wood, and that's the name first explorers gave to these islands due to the undisturbed forest covering the islands. For a forest of trees and bushes called laurel, you know, laurel leaves that are uh, used to make this a wreath crowning the Roman emperors or in ancient Greece, great athletes. And this type of wild forest landscape is disappearing in Mediterranean. But Madeira is one of the few places, not Mediterranean, but Atlantic, where this landscape, landscape still be observed and photographed. And one, the main forest, Laurel Forest, is UNESCO World Heritage uh, site, incredibly beautiful. We encountered in many natural pools all over the islands, and they often look so calm as if there is no ocean. Uh, nearby, like unaffected by the ocean. Traditional triangle houses in Madeira, it's a train bark of Madeira Island. And they, they are tiny. They lengths just uh, 23 feet. Their height is about 14 feet and the uh, roof is 60 degrees angle. And width is about 15 feet. They're very tiny. And their origin goes to first years of and 
uh, Europeans, um, Portuguese on the islands, and made of materials that could be easily found in the field. Nobody lives in these houses anymore, though the guide who brought us there to this Santana area of Madeira, he said that his grand-grandmother used to live in these houses. And now it's less for us, for visitors, to observe the earlier life in Madeira Islands. So why Madeira was so important for Henry the Navigator in particular, not just to put it on the map and say it's another place that we discovered. He wanted it to become a source of produce, source of important export commodity. And first it was wheat, but then he realized that exporting wheat would not bring much money. And he introduced sugar cane to Madeira to increase the revenue. He imported sh sugar cane from Sicily and quickly uh, it became the main uh, industry on the islands. It's a new economic phenomenon that was called white gold. So in the beginning of the 1500s in the 16th century, Madeira becomes the biggest sugar exporter in the world. Sugar was mainly sent uh, to England and Flanders and from there all over the world. So rum is still a sufficient part of um, the output in the islands. And we visited one of the oldest rum distilleries in the archipelago. And here when I am dancing between two huge um, barrels with rum, it was before we went through the rum tasting in anticipation. The, what's happening in the second half of the 1500s? Sugar of Madeira is not uh, the main thing anymore because other places produce in sugar. Think of Brazil. For Portugal, it's already it's Brazil. Or Cuba for the Spaniards. So there goes decline of sugar production. And sugar plantations were quickly replaced by enterprising Madeirans by vineyards. And sugar culture gave way to what called wine culture. And this and the wines from Madeira, Madeira wine acquired international fame and they provided, provided the rise of new social class, the bourgeoisie. Madeira wine was famous all over the world where people in different countries could not get enough of it. And I could not help it but introduce a special person that Alex and I have very special relationship with you. Many of you know us and know that we religiously go to Stratford uh, to, to the place of Shakespeare. Uh, he knew about Madeira very well. And I want to quote Henry IV, part one, where Edward, oh, called Ned points, was one of Prince Henry, not the navigator, Prince Henry IV, uh, closest friends. He remarks about Falstaff. He says, how agrees devil in thee about thy soul, that thou soldest him, him meaning Falstaff, on Good Friday last for a cup of Madeira. And in Richard III, Shakespeare cited the notoriety of Malvasia. It's a type of Madeira wine, very sweet, relating how Duke of Clarence, he was brother of King Edward IV, uh, George of York. He was executed by his brother, the king, for his multiple uh, betrayals. And um, Duke of Clarence chose his own way to die, and it was to be drawn in the barrel of his favorite wine in Madeira. So quite the stories. Uh, you will be arriving in Madeira by air, flying from Lisbon. And this is a shot that Alex did, I believe, from the airplane. And we already knew that it should be beautiful. Funcho, uh, the capital is really magnificent town. It a, was a standard port of call for ships heading to the New World or East Indias. And Funchal quickly became one of the richest cities in Portugal. It's a beautiful city by the sea. And, uh, you know, now it's a period of the fourth 
in main industry for Madeira. Its first one was wheat and then sugar and then Madeira. Now is tourism. And most of the visitors stay in Lido Funchal and many, many different beautiful hotels, the streets of old Funchal and there are treasures of historical city. I could not help but showing you cathedral, main cathedral, that one of the very few structures that survive virtually intact since the early colonization of Madeira. It's interesting that cathedrals were built of thousands, thousands of blocks of volcanic rocks that were carried from the cliffs. Museum of Sacred Art has great collections of the arts. It's mainly two departments. One is Portuguese art of the 15th and 16th century, and another Flemish arts of the 15th and early 16th century. Paintings, sculptures, jewelry, uh, pieces of art of great quality, but also what was surprising to us of great dimension, enormous altarpieces and triptychs. And I just imagine the bishops and archbishops of Flanders from Bruges and Antwerp, they wanted more and more Madeira wine. And so they went to their monasteries and churches, got pieces of art and shipped it to Madeira, Spain. But that's my theory, but I'm sure something close to it did happen. And here we meet face to face two great men that created Madeira, Prince Henry, of course, that you know, and the new um, person to introduce to you, uh, Jao Cosalves Jarko, who was born in Tamar and died in Fuchil. He was the captain who discovered, explored Madeira. He was the first hereditary leader on the island of Madeira. Madeira model was employed in Azores later and in Brazil and at other colonies of Portugal like Goa when large sections of land where captaincies or donatorias given to aristocrats from Portugal, and they were responsible for managing it, for cultivating and making it, for making this piece of land profitable. Jarko is Sephardic name. And many historians agree that you know, the discovery of Madeira most probably was of Jewish Conversa origin. Remember, there was no Jew by the end of the 15th century. Uh, and Jarko was prominent Jewish family from Lisbon. Moshe Jarko was King Jao II Taylor. And person that was known as Cristobal Colon or Christopher Columbus could have been of crypto Jewish descent. He was born on Cuba, Alentejo near about two hours drive from where uh, ever is. And his real name most probably was Salvador Fernandez Jarco. And we talk about it in part one. So we're now ready to enter a new chapter, the hidden Jewish history of Madeira. This history, and I repeat it a number of times during this evening, history of Jews in Madeira spans the entire lands of Madeira, discovery and development of the island itself. Jews have been associated with archipelago from the era of crypto Jews to World War II evacuees. And then so remember Anita Nowinski that she said that Madeira and Azores were settled and explored and developed by Converse Jews. You see, the uh, Jewish history of Madeira and Azores has two important moments, and it's true about Azores as well. The second one is very well researched maybe better in Azores than Madeira. And the second moment covers the beginning of 1800s with North African Jews coming and developing the islands further, uh, mostly wine industry in Madeira and um, 
textile industry and goes through World War II when evacuees from Gibraltar came to Madeira. The first period, crypto Jewish period, is not researched at all. And it takes a lot of patience, I always say, for the, for the patient and passionate Jewish history pilgrim. The islands will uncover one secret at a time. The first mentioning that I found, and I did not see anything else and any historian mention the other moments in history. 1461, Infante Dom Fernando, who was Prince Henry brother, he noted that people of Funchal called for ban on Jewish involvement in sugar industry and on having them Jews, beneficiaries, uh, having beneficiaries' rights on the island in 1561, the first documented reference to active participation of Jews in Madeira economy. It's now, uh, it's still almost 30 years before expulsion from Spain and um, 35 years uh, before expulsion of Jews and um, degree of forced conversion. In 2003, the book of renowned historian in Portugal, uh, George Valdemar Guerra was published, where he wrote about new Christian escaping the Inquisition in the mainland in arriving in Madeira. And he noted they, the Jews, combined commerce with scholarly activities. Why we are not surprised. Uh, Jews wanted to be sheltered by isolation, to put the ocean between them and the dreaded Inquisition, but then they're not free from Inquisition. Inquisitors visited Madeira in 1591, 92, and 1618. So many converses tried to escape to Protestant countries like Holland, to Amsterdam, or Germany, Hamburg. Most of those who stayed, they disappeared into the island. They intermarried or assimilated. My main challenge was to in trying to find famous Jewish personalities from Madeira was that when these people went to Amsterdam or Hamburg and returned to Judaism, they assumed Jewish names, but they were known by different Christian names while they were on the islands. So one of the famous Jewish personalities important for Jewish history, Jacob Israel Belmont, was Diaga Nunash Belmont in Madeira. He came to Amsterdam and when one was one of the movers and shakers, one of the founders of the Portuguese Jewish community in Amsterdam. You see, Jews who left before of the expulsion, they revitalized Jewish communities in Europe. They started new Jewish communities in New World, like Brazil or the United States. So this Jacob Israel Belmont, uh, he was famous philosopher and renowned poet, and he died rather young in his 50s, and a Shiva was founded in his honor that still exists in Amsterdam. We, I was not able to find his portraits, but the second person, Menasseh ben Israel, who was Manuel Diaz Soreiro in Madeira, he is so well known, not only from what he did for Jew, Judaism and Jewish history, but because also for, we have numerous uh, sketches by his good friend Rembrandt and his portrait. We know how Menasseh looked like. He was a brilliant Jewish theologian, wrote religious texts in multiple languages because he wanted Judaism to be understood to people of different religion. In 1626, he set up the first Hebrew press in Netherlands. He published on religious topics and engaged in conversation and debates with leading Purit, uh, Puritan theologians in Europe. But what's important, more important about ben Israel, Menasseh ben Israel, that he was instrumental in obtaining permission from Oliver Cromwell for the Jews to return 
to England. They were readmitted to England. They were expelled from England in the 1292, and they were readmitted in the 17th century. He wrote a book which intended to make Old Testament understood by simple people and Judaism more understandable to the Gentiles, a great man from Madeira. And now we're going to the 1800s, where's the second moment in Madeira and Jewish history, North African Jewish diaspora of the 19th century and evacuees from Gibraltar during World War II. Among many families surviving from North Africa, Morocco, French Algiers, from Gibraltar as well, uh, were a uh, number of Jewish families and probably the most successful in them, the most instrumental in developing uh, Jewish life in Madeira were Abu Darham family. Uh, Jose Abu Darham, you see his, his portrait, arrived in Funchal from French Algeria in the middle of 1800s. And they were so successful in various businesses, the in prominent place in Funchal society, became founders of commercial association of Funchal. When Jose died, his wife, widow, took over. She even renamed his company, which was Abu Darham and Sons. It became widow Abu Darham and Sons. There are very few traces of Jewish life from that period. So it is considered well-documented, probably with the one that was not documented, crypto judaic period. And one of these traces is what called Israeli or Jewish cemetery that was established by in 1851. You can access it when it's open, when you know the person who became our friend, that she's Jew by choice, who has the keys through the main gate. On this wavy pediment, you see various symbolic elements. And one of them, I liked it, uh, our glass with winds, meaning time flies, I think. So it's a cemetery that has been perched on the cliffs in the mid 19th century, established in 1851. And Abu Darham family has the most prominent places, all four generations uh, that lived in Madeira buried there, starting with uh, family patriarch, Reina Abu Darham in 1854, and the last one, her grand-granddaughter, Jana Sultana, 1976, we left few stones on the graves when at least know who these people were. It seems strange that the period that we know so much about, the period when Jews from North Africa arrived to Madeira still has so many unknowns. For example, the mysterious building in Funchal uh, is it synagogue? In some sources I read that the Chari Hashemaim, the gates of hope, but the building was built as a synagogue. Or maybe it's not. As the historian said, no, that was never a synagogue, and Shari Hashemaim was a synagogue built in Azores. So what we know for sure that it was probably was built in the 1850s, 1860s, and renovated in 1914 by famous architect from Lisbon, Miguel Ventura Terra. And uh, in this slide, you can see on the far left is Shari Tikva Gates of Heaven, synagogue from Lisbon. Those of you, and I know many of you were in Lisbon and visited the synagogue. He built the synagogue. So it is definitely the same architect. And we know there are documents that state that he renovated the building in 1914 in uh, Fincho But if it's not the synagogue, look at the windows and look at the Jewish star facade detail. If it's not the synagogue, I place it there. But it's still in mystery. And this building is under constant renovation and close. 
where you can see another trace of Jewish life in Madeira is in another museum. The museum is Das Cruzes, I think in Funchal. It's five contains collection, 500 years of art, ceramics, jewelry. And in the small silver room of this museum, few of Judaica yeah, objects are on display and they were given to the museum by prominent Jewish families of Madeira. Uh, World War II, Gibraltar sends few thousand of non-combatant citizens to Madeira. Why Gibraltar and why, uh, why Portugal? Why Portuguese archipelago? Between Portugal and Britain, uh, there is an agreement of perpetual help and friendship and cooperation, the oldest peace agreement in the world, going back to the time Philippe of Lancaster married John the First, parents of Henry the Navigator. It's the oldest agreement of peace uh, in the world. And Gibraltar people often tell me, oh, it's in Spain, it's Spanish. Why they send people to Portugal? Uh, Yes, geographically, Gibraltar, Rock of Gibraltar is in the Spanish territory, but it's not Spanish by any means. In 1704, Gibraltar was captured by the British Phil, fleet during the War of Spanish Succession, and it became British colony in the Spanish territory. Spain wants it back, United Nations wants uh, Port. Uh, and the British give it back to Spain, but Gibraltians, who are British citizens, overwhelmingly vote to stay well, to stay British. So because of the strategic importance of, importance of Gibraltar, Rock of Gibraltar, uh, the British government made the decision that they have to reinforce Gibraltar by uh, their military and to start evacuation, forceful evacuation of all non-combatant population. So they sent few thousand families to uh, Madeira and among them about 200 Jewish families. And these Jews were met with open heart and open arms and open purses by people of Funchal, people of Madeira. And when they left, they took with them the memory of the warmth and help how uh, they lived the war years uh, on the archipelago. And there is a small monument that was made in Gibraltar and sent to Funchal in 2009, the year when these two cities, Gibraltar and Funchal, became sister cities, signed by the mayors. And mayor of Gibraltar, Samuel Levy, was from the families that spent the war years in um, Madeira. Here is the name of those families. And we'll, and this warm note will leave Madeira and go to Azores. And if Madeira is uh, eight volcanic islands, Azores three times bigger than Madeira land portion. It's nine island groups and they inhabited islands. Uh, they were uninhabited when they were culture, uh, colonized by Portuguese in 1430s. Though uh, the first island to discover it was Santa Maria. You can see it in the right uh, low bottom corner of the map. But the islands like Flores and Corvo were not sighted or discovered until 1450, but we take uh, the years 1430s when Azores were developed. If Madeira was important for the uh, Portuguese crown because of the produce, the Azores strategic important was of paramount uh, played paramount role for the royalty because of their location it's like a stepping stone for the ships to pro progress down the coast of west africa or point of resupply for ships traveling back from east indies or on the way to the americas so let's talk the location the easternmost island santa maria the first one to be discovered is about 875 miles from mainland Portugal. But westernmost, look at the left upper corner, uh, island of Flores. 
is about 1200 miles, not from Portugal, but from Newfoundland, Canada. The islands are incredibly beautiful. And if you plan ever to visit the Azores, please remember that these islands are the tops of still active volcanic mountains of the Mid-Atlantic Range, and these mountains occasionally active. So don't tell me I didn't warn you. Uh, because of its strategic importance, Azores were eyed, jealously eyed by other European powers and the site of numerous sea battles, but Portuguese always managed to hold on to it. And its uh, largest, São Miguel, San Michael's Island in the Azores, of course, forts were built all over, and this 17th century fort was used even during World War II. Twin lakes located inside the crater of the old volcano and volcanic lakes always surrounded by pine trees. Incredible nature, massive, massive crater lake. And this mirador, the point of view that I like the best, and I'll tell you why after a few slides. There's a view to the left and there's a view to the right, but the reason not the natural beauty, why I like it so much, Santa Iria mirador. If you take letter N and put it between second I and A, you will get my name, Irina. And I was so proud I got into the Azores map. Furnace, small village with the hot springs and thermal pools. It's delightful scenery, but it's also an opportunity for an enterprising restaurant to cook your dinner with Mother Nature. Uh, they just need you to make reservations long in advance and six hours before you arrive to tell them whether they want vegetarian uh, what you want in your dinner that would be thermally cooked. And here is Alex anticipates his thermally cooked dinner to be served. What we did not anticipate that we will among this great scenery, amazing scenery, we also see uh, tea plantation, family run since 1880s, and they grow sell both black and green tea, which are actually very good. For the Architecture lovers, São Miguel Island is a paradise. You can see Gothic with still Romanesque influences and in your face, exuberant Baroque. They do have Manulin uh, influences also, parts of the ships and exotic fruits, but it's so large, it's in your face and absolutely irresistible. Look at that. It's white lime uh, stone and black basalt and decorations, all this wavy, like embroidery almost made in stone around uh, doors and cornices and windows. And now we're in Ponta Delgada, the capital of Azores, and of course, Fort. Now it's a military history museum. The monument to... Uh, Gonzalo Cabral, who discovered Azores and was first ruler, hereditary ruler on São Miguel Island. And Cabral is also Sephardic name. Uh, Gon uh, uh, I have to remember that and I should not pronounce it. Gonzalo Cabral's mother was great grandmother of Pedro Cabral who discovered Brazil. Uh, it's all runs in the family. <clears throat> the second monument, beloved by everyone in Ponta Delgada, is immigrant monument. And it's dedicated to people who left Azores in the late 19th and early 20th century they to escape no not political persecution but the terrible poverty of the time many of them went to the united states and there are large azorean diaspora people from the azores from ponta delgado and other islands in new york and new jersey and in california and most of them in massachusetts and we will talk about diaspora and Azorians who live in Boston and Falls River, Massachusetts, and the role they play in rebuilding 
Jewish monument to Jewish history in Azores. Uh, beautiful, uh, maj majestic squares in the capital, Ponta Delgada. We were there on April 24th that commemorates Carnation Revolution, peaceful end to dictatorial regime of uh, Salvador, Salazar. A beautiful square with a townhouse, 16th century palace at the statue of San Miguel, beautiful, even more beautiful at night, great squares, and of course, magnificent churches of Ponte Delgado and Baroque and streets. And now we are entering the hidden Jewish history of the Azores, just like with Madeira. Jewish presence in the Azores is old, old as the recorded history of archipelago. And it also has two distinctive moments. The second, which began at the start of the 19th century, continued through the 20th, North African uh, Jew, Jews arrive and go through not evacuees period when not evacuees from Gibraltar, but Ashkenazi Jews escaping uh, Nazi occupied Europe coming. And the first which kind period which coincided with the discovery and settlement, settlement of the Azores in the 15th, 16th century. And it's this is the one that not documented at all. Uh, you see, Portugal is different from Spain, where old and new Christians kept separately, but in Portugal, they melted. And uh, so it was hard to say who is who. And of course, new Christians, what they wanted most of all is disappearing to the island, and they did. That's why it's very difficult to find first Jewish history of the Azores. Genetic studies that was conducted in 2004-2006 showed that 14% of the Y chromosome of Azorian of Jewish origin, facts that suggest the importance of Jewish presence there for many, many centuries. Uh, but uh, you can see in this opening photo of this chapter, you can see a new friend, Dr. José del Mello, who knows that he comes from new Christian family. He told us that he thinks it's not just 14%, that's probably most of the people in Portugal have Jewish blood because Jews were there for 2000 years. They're here, they're in us, he tells us. The famous Jewish personality from the Azores, I could not help but you know, tell you about him, Manuel Cardoza de Machedo Macedo, in his multiple worlds. He was born and raised in a um, very religious, very Jew-hating old uh, Catholic family. He was raised in the as an Azorian Catholic youth. He went to study and work in England. He met Protestants, and he decided that he can serve God when he becomes a Calvinist. When he come, came back home, he did not hide it, so he was denounced to the Inquisition. He was arrested and taken to Lisbon Inquisition prisons. And while there, he met a man who was arrested for the worst crime for the Inquisition, for Judaizing, for secretly practicing Judaism. And during his communion conversation with this man, uh, Cardoza realized that to serve God, he has to become a Jew. So he signed the papers that he is returning to Catholicism. He will become good, again, good Catholic. He was let, uh, uh, set free. And instead, clandestinely, he left Azores. He embraced Judaism, became formally Jew in Hamburg, then settled in Amsterdam. And he wrote a brilliant book, Life of Abraham Pellegrino, A Young Man Journey in Search of the Divine Truth. And it's quite a story. So Azores uh, filled with legends and myths. 
And uh, I just love this poem. Where are your mo monuments, your battles, marches? Where is your tribal memory? Source in that great wall, the sea. The sea has locked them up. The sea is history. And I thought that few words could better serve as an introduction to the history of the Sephardic Atlantic. You see what the Jews pushed out of Iberia where they lived for over 2000 years and escaped, Iberia escaped, Spain escaped, Portugal. What they did in addition to revitalizing Jewish communities in Europe, creating new ones, they built dynamic Atlantic world where uh, different cultures met probably for the first time. And this cross-cultural multinational influences over this in these trade routes really opened the door for personal transformation, for exchange of ideas. That's probably the story of Card Cardoza. That's what it brings us to. So the history of the Sephardic Atlantic. Uh, one of the legends concerned the city on Terceira Island called Porto Judeo. And there are at least four different legends that we heard and we found. One of them was and when uh, the ship of the Portuguese uh, arrived to Terceira, there was terrible weather, storm, and someone they thought was secret Jew on the ship, and they said, and they uh, began yelling to him, jump, Jew, jump. And he did. They saw it was safe and they landed. And so the place where the step ashore got the name Porto Judea. There was another ship at another time. After the expulsion, forced conversion, 1497, Jews were not allowed either to leave mainland or to arrive there. Those who tried and were caught were taken to a ship to get them away from the country. And when they again in a storm approached the Terceira, the government allowed the Jews to disembark and the place were allowed to settle what named Porto Judea. One of the many, many uh, legends. Another one is the cult of Holy, Holy Spirit that people tell us has Jewish influence. Nobody will tell you Jews invented the festival of Holy uh, Spirit. It's actually, they uh, was was born in 11th and 12th century Europe in the uh, brotherhood society that contested the divinity of Christ. And this festival just died out, but miraculously it survived in the Azores. Why? Fanciful little chapels called emporiums are uh, all over the archipelago, and it's like a cross between uh, wedding cake or one room school uh, schoolhouse but it's this uh places where this holy spirit festival is celebrated the celebration falls on the seventh sunday following easter roughly period between passover and Shavio. emporiums have no christian symbols to identify them as places for religious ceremonies it's just the name it's a festival of holy spirit the bread is baked with a symbol printed uh uh, on it, on this bread. And it's a huge feast to which even the strangers are invited. But people believe the Jews develop it the way it is at a certain point in history because they wanted to become part of larger culture. There are no mention of, and there are no crosses, no angels, it's just abstract God. So that's one of the legends again to the Sir surviving festival. The synagogue story that of Ponte Delgado is quite remarkable, from abandoned ruins to the Jewish cultural center and museum. It was very hard to find you because it looks like typical Azorian house. And it's actually the synagogue. Remember, synagogue cannot look like synagogue, cannot look like a um, place of worship. It has to be covered <laughs> with a fence or be inside the house. Uh, until 1910. So the, when Jewish community dwindled through intermarriage, assimilation, due to the economy, Jews uh, 
assimilated or left the Azores. There were no faithful anymore. The synagogue actually was built in 1836 and became the oldest uh, synagogue built in Portugal after the expulsion. And now it's a wonderful, wonderful museum of Jewish history and Jewish culture and a place for concert. And this photograph taken just half an hour before beautiful Hebrew, they say Hebrew, but there are Yiddish songs as well, were played a concert that was played, performed from the women's balcony. And our new friend, Jose Del Mello, shows us around its entire history of the Jewish Adores and the founders, especially important, are people of uh, Ben Saud family, and they still uh, leaders and owners of uh, management of the corporation, a very diverse uh, group of companies. It was Abraham Ben Saud was the first founder, and one of the last Ben Sauders. Uh, the cemetery story, as was told to us by the man who called himself the last full-blooded Jew of the Azores. The cemetery dates to 1834 and about 50 tombs. And uh, on the left is José del Melo, and in the center is George del Mar. He thinks he's the last Jew in the Azores. He is happily married. He has few grandchildren who were raised uh, and children raised Catholic. His wife is Catholic. He was the one who took many Jewish objects and books from the synagogue to save um, uh, when the building was almost uh, in ruins. And the building came alive. In the first in the 1880s, uh, 1980s, 1990s, and reconsecrated as not a synagogue, but the Museum of Jewish Culture. The leaders of this new life of the synagogue were members of Ben Saudi family from um, Lisbon. Many of Ben Saudi is buried in this uh, cemetery. And Azorian Jewish Foundation, which uh, was founded by uh, members of Azorian diaspora in Massachusetts and by non-Jews, by non-Jewish senator. So the synagogue got a new life. And so the cemetery was restored as well. Many names are easily readable. If they're not on Hebrew that we can't read, uh, we read those from Portuguese and uh, recognize the founder's roster that we had in the museum. And at the end, we're running out of time, but I will be talking very quickly because I have to tell you the mystery of the Safra Torah of the Azores. Unresolved mystery. So we will start by mapping the Torah mystery. Start with the beginning of the story as we learn about it. We are now in uh, São Miguel Island, you can see Ponta Delgada, and you can see also a fishing village, Rabo de Pesha. And Pesha means fishtail because they say the village looks like fishtail. It's the largest fishing port in the Azores. And it also used to be one of the before uh, Portugal became part of the European Union. It used to be one of the poorest areas in Europe. In 1997, small group of schoolboys, some people say two, some people say four, will say small group of schoolboys were playing hooky from school and playing in sea caves in this village. And they found strange ancient document in a scroll in the sea cave. It was in a plastic bag. They thought that they can sell pieces of this document, so they vandalized it, took pieces of this ancient document. Uh, they even tried to burn a bit in the end so it would look even more ancient. When they could not sell it, they decided to share the secret with their teacher. Maybe she, she or he wouldn't be angry with them for missing classes. The, 
uh, again, the story var uh, varies whether the teacher went with the boys right away and found this plastic ba bag or they could not find it. It was found near the football field, different stories. But when she found that uh, document, she did not know how Torah is supposed to look like. She realized that it probably important historical object. She called the police, police called the city hall, the city hall called Lisbon. Uh, Lisbon experts arrived, identified it, that it's a Torah, and took it to Lisbon to restore it. Uh, they also found the cover for the Torah. And this Torah spent many years in different workshops and going through restoration process in the National Library and Restoration Labs in Lisbon, where it was identified that this Torah came from Morocco from early 1800s. And it also had a cover which was machine made, contemporary, was Ashkenazi cover. Until we learned this story, I didn't know the difference. The Ashkenazi cover, it's one piece. You put it on the dress the Torah this way, then you address the Torah. And Sephardi cover has a split opening in the back. So you can take uh, with your right hand, you can go inside and take Torah out of the cover. So it was a Sephardi old cover with a contemporary Ashkenazi mantle. So we don't know who put this Torah first and the cover in a plastic bag. The Torah was not damaged by the sea. So the experts say that uh, the document spent very short time in a sea cave. Otherwise, it would be um, much severe, more severely damaged. Who put it there? Why plastic bag? Was it the person who wanted to... Uh, hide it, stole it from where? Because the synagogue did not miss any Torahs. So it's still questions that we had no answer. After Torah was restored, was returned to Lisbon and placed in the archives of the regional archives of the public library. So at this point of the story, we don't know where it came from, how it got into a plastic bag and how it got a Ashkenazi cover. So continue mapping out Torah mystery. We will be going to a different island, to Terceira Island, and you can see the capital of this island, main city is Angra, and you can see Porto Judeo there, and further north, you can see the Air Force Base. So we go a bit uh, back in history, just about 25 years, to 1970 or 1971, to the Lajesh a uh, Portugal airport base where a young Jewish officer serves with U.S. Air Force on this Portuguese air base called Lajesh. I'm sure I'm butchering the name. And this young Jewish officer is passionate hist amateur historian. He is very interested in Jewish history of the of Portugal and of the Azores and of the Terceira Island. He learns about Porto Judeo. He drives there, it seems a big distance of just 15 kilometers, and tries to learn from the natives with whatever capacity of Portuguese language he acquired at that time. Why is the name? So he hears some of the stories about Jung Jew and others. He discovers old Jewish cemetery in Terceira, but he continues coming uh, to village, uh, to Porto Judea, drink the wine with the locals and ask them about the Jews. You know, are there any secret, are there any secret Jews? Uh, where did they live? And the uh, Locals just say, we don't know anything. And until one man says, we don't know anything about the Jews, but we have something Jewish for you. And he delivers old wooden box to this officer. When officer opens the box, he sees the ancient Torah without the cover. This officer also happened to be observing Jew who was a lay leader for this small 
uh, group of Jewish officers on the base and their families. So he uses this Torah with the help of Catholic chaplain who was educated in Vatican and knew how to read Torah. So he uses Torah for the services. He also takes the measurement of the Torah, sends it to New York to order the cover. So at least we know uh, that this ancient Torah got contemporary Ashkenazi cover. In 1972, the officer is reassigned. He leaves Tarsera, he leaves Azores, and he leaves Torah in the specially created uh, cabinet for it. And now we have to go even further back in history to the year 1824, when a man, Jewish man named Memun Abobot comes from, who was born in 1800 in Magador in Morocco. He comes to Portugal. He first in Lisbon, then he goes to Terceira, starts his businesses with very, very successful financially. And he's also very religious. And when he meets a number of Jewish family in Terceira, he wants to create a congregation and he builds, creates a synagogue in his own house. And he has one or two Torahs that he either brought with him from uh, Morocco or he ordered them in Morocco. He uses it for the service. He dies in 1875. And in his will, and it's very important, he wants his family to follow his wishes. One, he had seven children, and two of them were already dead before his passing. So he wants to be buried in Angra, in the city, in where he lived, in the Jewish cemetery next to his children. And if there will be no Jews in the uh, Intercera Island, he wants his remains to be taken to the place where he is from, to Magador, to be buried there. And he had two Sephra Torahs, Sepharim Torahs, in his um, estate, he wants one Torah sent to Ponte Delgada and another one sent to Morocco, to Magador. One historian I came to know who was fascinated with this Torah story, he checked with his connections in both Lisbon and Ponte Delgado. Nobody ever knew anything from something being sent from Terceira Island of Taurus being sent there. Did uh, Abobat own the mysterious Torah? Was it one of the two Sepharim Torahs that he had? That in, who was the man who gave the Torah to the young Jewish officer on the eighth uh, air base? And uh, so, uh, and where was Torahs that were supposed to be sent to two different places in Portugal. Where was this Torahs for the hundred years since Aboba death? And who was the man who had the box? So we don't know. And, and if the man was given the Abobot's Torah, how did this Torah happen to be in the sea cave uh, in a fishtail village in a different island. So there are very many questions. What we know for sure, when in 2015, the story was placed in the archives, the retired American officer was just happened to be on a cruise with a stop on the Azores. He was invited to come and look at the Torah. And this Torah, I remind you, was found in a sea cave in Ponta del Ga, uh, in São Miguel Island. And he said, yes, it's the same Torah that he meets after 34 years, uh, the same one that was presented to him by a local man in the old wooden box, and the same one he ordered the cover from New York, the same one he used for his services. So we went to see this Torah, uh, went to the public library regional archives in the beautiful Jesuit college, and that's how it looks like, snagged in a beautiful velvet box, and this is Ashkenazi style mantle. 
and you can even see the edges that they built, uh, the boys were trying to burn. So what we know for sure, that as confirmed by the former Air Force officer, the fish tail uh, Sao Miguel Torres became to be known as the same one given to him by local man on Tercera Island, 1970-71. And that was the officers that ordered the cover from New York. As identified by the restoration and ancient documents expert in Lisbon, the Torah is from Morocco and dated to early 1800s, but two islands about 114 miles apart. What we don't know, what this Torah brought from Morocco by Maimon Ababo to Terceira in 1824. Is this Torah one of the two sepharim used by Ababo in his synagogue services until his death? And was his dying wish concerning the Torahs ever followed and how, who sent what where? Who was the local man given the old wooden box with Sephra Torah to the American Jewish officer? Where was Torah hidden until 1970-71? And when and how did the Torah disappear from the air base in Tercera? And the key question. How the Torah from Tessera ended up in the sea cave near the fishing village. So it's quite an interesting story. We were fascinated by it as well. And now just what we learn from Madeira and Azores Jewish narratives. Taken as a whole, Sephardic experience manifests itself as a key component of not only Jewish, but also world history. And the Sephardic changed the world history. The Jewish presence in the Madeira and Azores Islands is as old as recorded history of both archipelagos. There are five historic geopolitical factors that determined and shaped Jewish present Jewish experience in archipelagos, and we talked about each one of them, the age of discovery and Jewish role there, Edict of expulsion and from Spain, Portugal, forced conversion, the Inquisition, persecutions, massacres. Finally, legislative changes, separation of church and state, and World War II. The Jewish presence has two distinctive moments on both archipelagos. archipelagos. The second began at the start of 19th century through the 20th, and it's well documented with still a number of uh, unknowns. Uh, it's arrival of North African Jews, early 1800 Jewish refugees, in the Azores, Jewish evacuees during World War II. And the first one, the discovery settlement of the archipelagos, 15th, 16th century is not documented at all. New Christians disappeared into the islands. That's what they wanted and what they did. Except for two people, Alex and I know of. One is our friend, Jew by choice in the Madeira, and one elderly Jewish man in the Azores. Except these two, there are no Jews in the archipelagos today. However, Jewish contributions transformed this archipelagos, the economic and social history, and they influenced the emergence of the new dynamic Jewish Atlantic world. And now, um, if you have questions that you want to ask me, uh, please, you know, do now or write to me. We often continue conversation for a long, long time after the lecture.